Now there are many attacks we can run on the victim. Client side attacks. Let's take a look at some of the popular ones. First one, first and foremost, the one everybody does, cross-site scripting, sometimes called CSS, sometimes called XSS. So cross-site scripting is an attack where we insert some sort of malicious JavaScript and the client executes it. Now the way this happens is, you know, with social media, people have, they have the ability to post stuff and they talk about their day, they show pictures, what am I doing, where am I at, etc. And other people go and read those posts, right? Um, now, if you look at HTML, what you see in your browser is not everything that your browser is downloading. In addition to the stuff that just is presented visually to the viewer, there can be all sorts of scripting and interactive components that make that thing interactive. Now, ordinarily in a Facebook post, you shouldn't have a lot of interactive components, but there might be things like like buttons and uh, click a link and that sort of thing. So what we could do with cross-site scripting is when I put up a post, it will include as part of the post, as part of the HTML, malicious Java code, JavaScript code. And that malicious JavaScript code will instruct the victim's browser to do something in the background while they are reading my story of the day. And so that is cross-site scripting. Now that depends on a website that has blogs and forums and posts and product reviews and anything where you can put up something that's kind of unstructured. Now that depends on the website not checking, not validating input. So I'll put up all this garbage with this malicious script that's part of it. And people are reading my funny story, looking at my pictures, and their browsers executing this malicious script at the same time. That's cross-site scripting. So with cross-site scripting, um, there's a forum, there's a place to put in reviews, social media posts. Uh, and what my malicious code can do in the background is steal cookies, read sensitive info, inject malware, install a Trojan, uh, whatever, install a keylogger, uh, just whatever you want it to run in the background. So while the user is enjoying whatever I posted on that page, the browser in the background is executing the malicious code, which is part of my posting. This is one of the most popular and effective browser attacks that there is. Uh, there are three general categories of cross-site scripting. One is something called stored or persistent. Stored as XSS, we inject the script in our blog post and it stays on the server. Another one is something called reflected. And what it is is that I manage to get something on a client who unknowingly tries to upload it to the server which sends it back to the client. And, be, and although that sounds funny, the client because it trusts the server, will then execute this thing. And then there's something called DOM-based, which is ex uh, executed completely on the client, has nothing to do with uh, involving a server at all. So three common mechanisms. So how do I do this? Well, I can um, use social engineering, or I can just flat out hide the code in the background. Um, if my attack is going to be persistent, I have to modify data that is stored by the web app. So uh, you maybe like you have forms that you know are going to store data, like a feedback page on a site. You could try putting your um, malicious code up in that. Now, what's interesting is that different places to inject code into a feedback page or a forum or a, uh, a um, social media page, they're actually not all of them visible in a browser. So you need to analyze the source uh, underneath the source code uh, uh, that is on the page. Uh, you may also be able to um, use POST, the POST H uh, method in HTTP. It just kind of depends upon what the web app uses. Now it's beyond the scope of this class to start talking about uh, coding cross-site scripting attacks and coding in JavaScript and that sort of thing. But you should be aware of these kinds of things. You should be aware that they exist. Another very popular one is something called the cross-site request 
forgery attack, or XSRF, or sometimes CSRF. This is where the user already has logged on to the site, and there's a trust between the website and the user. Like, as a user, I've logged on to eBay or Amazon, and the website trusts me because I've logged in. And we are exploiting the server's trust in the user. So what happens is, in uh, CSRF or XSRF, the user connects to Amazon, connects to eBay, connects to something, and they're shopping or doing something, or they're, they're banking, or they're doing something where the server says, I trust you because you've already authenticated. While they're doing that thing, you somehow, off to the side, nothing to do with the browser, manage to send them something malicious, typically an email. Hopefully they open the email up or they open the message or the whatever it is while they're doing the banking or while they're doing the shopping because you know people will multitask, right? Your message looks harmless, but there is either a malicious link or malicious code or something in that message that instructs the user, oh and by the, or not the user but the user's browser. Oh and by the way, while you're connected to Amazon, order $5,000 worth of something in the background and send it to me. And so uh, the user is doing their normal shopping or banking or whatever they're doing. They, at the same time, open up something malicious, which then, in addition to the normal shopping and banking, sends a request through that browser connection to do an additional transaction that is malicious. The website does not know the difference it thinks that the user has just asked for two things. And the user doesn't visually see it because it's happening in the background. That's a cross-site request forgery, XSRF. So we craft a URL, typically we send it to the victim, they click a link, um, and uh, they automatically uh, download something that tells them to do, tells their browser to do something uh, malicious in the background. It's really hard to detect. The attack is carried out by the user's browser as if the user authorized it. So the user could enter the same URL manually, get the same result. It's really impossible for a browser to know that this came from something other than the user, and it's really impossible for the website to know that as well. It is challenging to execute because you have to know just the right moment when the user is doing something that you can take advantage of. And you have to find just the right form that will do just the right malicious thing. So it kind of depends on you knowing that the user always goes to Amazon, always goes to eBay, always goes to online banking, and you've already kind of figured out how in the background you can submit a request to that. And you need to know the values because you, you can't see it. And you can't see what's going on. All you know then is maybe stuff arrives at your doorstep that was purchased or money is suddenly transferred to you. Another attack method, session replay. Okay, so here I am sniffing away and there is, you, you log in or you do something, typically some kind of authentication. I'll just grab it and I'll replay it. And so I'm grabbing your authentication token or your login credentials or whatever and I'm just sending it again as it is. So the website thinks that this user is logged into two locations, from this browser and from this browser. And not necessarily, necessarily geographical locations, but maybe it thinks the user has a laptop and a tablet or something like that. So that's a session replay attack. Session fixation attack, this one's really interesting. Wouldn't it be nice if we could control ahead of time what, what the user's session is? Well. So let's say they go to Amazon or eBay or something like that all the time, and they get these sessions. What's to keep you from going to Amazon or eBay and also getting a session token? You could get that. And then what you do is you somehow manage to slip that to the user and trick their browser into not using their own token, but using your token, which now you are in control of. That's session fixation where you have them fixated on your token, not theirs. The user, of course, has no idea this is going on. So um, 
Section, uh, session fixation execution includes we get a token in the URL or in a hidden form field or hidden in a cookie. So here's our example of our session fixation attack. So um, I, as the attacker, log on to the website and I get a session ID. Let me just zoom in a bit so you can see it. So I do an, an actual login and I get a session ID, A, B, C, D. And then what I do is I somehow manage to send uh, something malicious, a link or something to the victim. And when they click it, now suddenly they have the session ID, ABCD, which they will use ABCD when going to the website along with their username and password. So the cool part is they have used the cookie ABCD. They have authenticated with their username and password. I now just simply use ABCD because the user has already logged in. The web server thinks that the same user just has two devices or two sessions. I'm using ABCD. They did the username and password with my ABCD cookie. And so that is the session fixation attack example. So those are some common client-side attacks.